When we hear the word engineering, the Defence Forces isn't necessarily the first thought that comes to mind. But we're here in Lynch Camp in Kilworth to talk to Captain Diane Byrne and Lieutenant Stephen Ryan. And we're going to find out why the Corps of Engineers is known as the lifeline of the Defence Forces. Welcome to Kilworth Camp. We are down on the Corps of Engineers annual tactical exercise. We've got some engineering projects on site today. Brilliant. Would you like to come have a look? Loved it, that's Let's great, yeah. So Steve and Diane, you're both engineers within the Defence Forces. You wouldn't necessarily think of engineering when you think of the Defence Forces. How exactly does this fit in? I suppose engineering the Defence Force is the, the wide palette of tasks from bridging to trackway to explosives, um, uh, battlefield area clearance, um, engineer specialist search and clearance, um, mine warfare, mine clearance. Uh, we're looking at firefighting, water purification, uh, general engineering services. You're, you're covering the, the, the full range really of, of military tasks in some way or another. So really there's a huge range um, of skills involved in your job then. What did you study, Diane? How did you get here? It was purely accidental. It, I wasn't um, aiming for the Defence Forces from, from childhood. It certainly wasn't a lifelong dream or anything like that. Um, I came out of college, was applying for jobs around the various different, different areas and the Defence Forces came up and it was right time, right place. So I was uh, studying mechanical engineering in UCD and uh, towards the end of my final year I became interested in joining the Defence Forces, so um, after graduating I was successfully was accepted to do a cadetship. I became aware of the fact that there was a, a small number of vacancies in the Engineering Corps, and because I'd had a, a degree in Mechanical Engineering I was eligible to apply. So it's not necessarily a 9 to 5 job from the sounds of things, can you talk us through what a typical day is like? Well in terms of a typical day, like uh, they say the Defence Force is a life less ordinary, but it, it really is, like there is, no, there is no 9 to 5, certainly not in the past 6 months anyway, just uh, Maybe add by way of an example, like in this year, I instructed on a course for 10 weeks. Like for the first number of weeks, we could be out on a bridging site at 8 o'clock in the morning, building bridges right through to 4, 5, 6 in the evening. And then later on in the course, we move into the explosive module. So some days we might be, we might be in work for uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. We might be gone till 8, 9 that night, basically setting up explosive practices and uh, doing heavy demolitions, um, uh, battle simulations. I would spend a lot of my time dealing with contractors, consultants, preparing contracts, sending them out to tender. Um, I, my job would hugely involve accounts and budgets and um, getting the, the best um, works for the money that we have available to us. So there, there's a huge crossover there from, from one side to the other. So Stephen, why are we in a field with uh, the guys here behind us building a bridge? I will, uh, the troops behind us here are uh, building a medium girder bridge. We're down here for two weeks on our training exercise, so we're in week one now, so we're just, we're just training yeah. to prepare for the exercise next week. So what's going on here is basically the troops are just practicing building the bridge sure. over a dry gap as such, like there, 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 there is no gap to, to be bridged. By doing this we can highlight any problems that we have. How does maths, you know, tie into what we're doing right now? Well the particular type of bridge we're building here, the MGB, can actually be built in a number of different configurations. As, you're, as we look here now, it's built in double storey. It can also be built in single storey and the number of bays that can be constructed can be either increased or decreased. So I mean, in terms of working out weights and tonnages and configurations the, build is going to, the bridge will be built in, maths is very relevant. What advice would you have for students who are, say, watching this and potentially thinking about studying engineering? It goes without saying anyone who's looking to get into engineering this one needs to start off with maths. Now I know ideally it's, uh, it's if, you, if you can go down the higher level of maths, but I know there is routes now where you can maybe go ordinary level maths and then you can carry on from there and maybe get access into a, a postgraduate engineering course and from then you know if, if you're if you're still interested by all means look at a, a, applying to the defense force you know it's, it's not for everyone certainly but uh, there is a unique set of challenges there and opportunities that you're, you're not going to get provided in other other civilian organizations engineering in itself for fifth and sixth years is so intimidating in that it's so large and it's very hard to pinpoint and narrow down exactly what it means and which areas to concentrate on. Um, I, all I would advise to people in that regard is to 
not try to see if you would be suited to that ahead of time. It, you don't know until you try it, particularly with the Defence Forces. And that was my attitude coming in. I'll give it a go. I'll see what it's about. It was a very interesting concept. Didn't know if it was for me. Um, and you give it what you have and it's paid off. Engineering probably wouldn't be a typical career for a girl to consider coming out of an all-girls school traditionally. You obviously broke through that barrier. What you know, drove you to commit to it and what do you think the challenges are for girls now thinking of taking the same direction? What I would advise any of the girls out there to do is if you think you don't have to know at this stage, but if you think that it's something that you'd be interested in and you don't fall into the categories that seem to be put in front of you. Um, when I was there, it was nursing, travel and tourism, and they just didn't suit me. Um, I knew that and um, I pushed through and I was very lucky I had the support of my family because they were going into parent-teacher meetings, getting hitting a wall themselves, being told, this is not on, she needs to go a different route. So I did choose the certificate route because I was nervous myself. I didn't, wasn't sold on the idea of engineering either. So I went down the route of a certificate, said if I did two years and I didn't like it, I could change, but I had something to show for those two years. But I decided that, that it was for me and I kept going. What do you like most about working in the Defence Forces? The diversity. You come in in the morning, you really don't know what you could be doing that day. You can plan your day as best you can. Um, with the small numbers of engineers that are in the Defence Forces, you could be doing anything at all from, from one end of the day to the next. That's, that's the, the key for me. It keeps the challenges and keeps the interest levels going. In terms of career progression, certainly uh, the intention would be in the Defence Force, you'd, you'd never spend more than a, a few years in the same job. That You'd constantly re rotate as an officer in terms of, in terms of roles and in terms of uh, location throughout, throughout the country. Um, there, there's certainly massive, massive scope for career progression. Um, in, in, in different appointments, certainly within the engineering core, maybe from the you could be involved with the, the field side of it, the combat engineering, engineering side, but then there would be scope to maybe move across to the maintenance side where you look, you know, you might be looking at more, you know, the, the civil side of the house in terms of uh, en energy awareness. Would it ever happen that an engineer in the Defence Forces would be deployed, say, to help out in times of emergency? Well, there has been an example in, in recent years where there was a member of the Engineering Corps was deployed as part of the Rapid Response Corps to Haiti okay, yeah. to assist with that after the natural disaster that occurred there. There was also a couple of engineer officers in the past um, travelled um, after the tsunami happened, mm -hmm. so they went over in a support element in relation to that type mm -hmm. of thing. And then you would have the emergency response at home. So actually there there'd be a real element of reward, you know, you can see you're actually directly helping out people by, you know, doing your job. You're able to help people um, and it's only the extreme weather conditions we've had recently that have seen how vulnerable, vulnerable people can be and um, the support we can offer them and it's very rewarding. Last Sunday we moved into a, an exercise area just uh, south of Kilworth where we've been uh, exercising for the past 48 hours. And we're going to move now into an area, the exercise area, and you'll get to see all the engineering assets uh, deployed in a realistic scenario. So behind us here we have the MGB medium girder bridge. Again, yeah, you remember from last week we had this deployed in the training area in Kilworth. We've now um, moved the bridge on site and we've uh, deployed it in a, in a live realistic scenario where it's crossing uh, the river function just to, uh, to our rear. The bridge built in its current configuration can uh, withstand loads up to 70 tonnes. Uh, each of the, the MOAG APCs weighs uh, 18 and a half tonnes each. Uh, in terms of uh, the calculations you have to do to uh, determine what size bridge you need to, to build, obviously yet again you need to determine what actual load you want the, the bridge to take. From then you take what span is required. An amalgamation of the two can uh, and some other mathematical calculations allows you to develop what, what uh, configuration of bridge you need to build. And what, uh, another important thing about the, uh, the bridge here is the bridge isn't built in isolation. We have a trackway for the bridge and beyond the bridge. Uh, bad weather on, on ground in, in tandem with heavy vehicles tends to destroy the ground. We have uh, 50 metre spools of trackway which can be deployed. The, the low capability of our uh, trackway is 70 tonnes. So yeah, when you combine those, those two together it gives the engineers uh, a great capacity to reach remote locations. So yeah, this is the infantry assault bridge that the helicopter dropped in earlier. Once it's on site, which you've a, you've a, a section of uh, well-trained engineering soldiers, it can be built in 10 minutes. Unfortunately, when you're in a lot of overseas situations or a lot of uh, situations that militaries find themselves working, there might necessarily be accessibility to fresh drinking water the whole time. So as a result of that, uh, it's important that militaries have, and we have them here in the engineering corps, water purification units. So this unit that we have here is the Barrel 3000. It has the capacity to purify up to 4,500 litres of water every hour. 
The concept behind how it works is a principle known as reverse osmosis. It'll take in water from a source, whether that be a river or a well. The water will flow through the, the, the plant system. It, it initially, it'll, get a, it'll pass through some filters, which will just filter out the, the heavy components, you know, big, big particles as such. From there, it'll move into uh, three, three separate modules, which are called reverse osmosis modules. After that happens, a small amount of purifying additives are added, and from then you get a, a permeate at the end of the process, which is drinkable water. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the type of work done by the members of the Defence Forces, both here and abroad, and the vital importance that maths and engineering play in that work.